So there's three key words in that statement. Prioritize, lead, and progressive. And I'm going to look here about prioritization. And everything, I'm going to go to you first. Because when I speak to people beforehand and get their thoughts, Eglise, you were very left field. You said to me, prioritization, the core of that is the social responsibility of the organization. And you said, focus on that and it always pays off. Why do you think that? Okay, wonderful. Okay, thanks for, thanks, thanks for, for, for that, Peter, and thanks a lot for inviting us here. Um, yeah, so, so I, I wanted to share maybe two things. One is really this big picture, and, and we'll talk about it as well a, a bit further down in the conversation. Of When we're looking at, at prioritization, we tend to look at bottom, bottom up. We're looking at what are the different criteria, and you're going into, into the sausage machine a little bit. But the first thing I, I really like to do first is to anchor ourselves in, in our very big and audacious goal. And the big and audacious goal, I think you were talking a little bit earlier about you know, looking not only at your customer or consumer, but at the domain and the experience. And a lot resides into this. So when I talk about the, the social responsibility of the enterprise, it's really what is going to be the end consumer's experience? What is going to happen out there? What is the role that you have not only of the products you deliver, whether it's a digital or physical product, but how do you deliver it and what is the experience? And I find that when we anchor ourselves in this big audacious goal, they always have a, a really strong commercial payback, but they are giving you a lot of um, very fine um, uh, criteria to do the prioritization afterwards. So we're not saying only we're going to grow X percent on the market. And I'll illustrate in, in, in just a second with an example of something we are doing like that at Pexa. But for instance, one of our ambition is to improve what we call the Hyundai settlement. So Pexa being a technology platform organization, we're organizing housing settlement between your conveyancer, your banks, the seller's conveyancer and bank, land registries, etc. The process works perfectly well, the platform works perfectly well. What doesn't work always well is that you'll have pockets of the system, maybe there is something, a document that is not there at the bank, maybe there is a piece of um, the conveyancer hadn't prepared the document, something like that. So our responsibility is to improve the on-day settlement. It means you as a consumer, what is going to be your experience? <clears throat> You're about to get in your property, you want your keys, uh, but something is going wrong and you won't have them today, you'll have them in days. It has a huge impact on people, actually. So we are taking our responsibility into, now we're going to improve that for the market. And we'll be doing this with a lot of technology injection with our partners, but we'll do as well with reports and influencing and industry group, etc. So this is just an example of looking at what's our social responsibility, what are the goals, and then when we build all those integration and resilience projects with my peers, we have this compass that, that we can own together. Okay, I'm just curious though, Eglatine, because you've got a stakeholder in the business that says, I need this now, and you're saying, I'm thinking about my social responsibility. How do you finesse those needs of somebody who has a, a problem or a challenge yeah. and a need to think broadly? Yeah, and, and that's, that's super important because even when you, when you think about social responsibility, you know, we have... have a, uh, huge responsibility are leaders nowadays in Australia in how do we influence climate change, how do we influence diversity, you know, so it's not only how do I deliver my product, what's my responsibility? So, so it can get lost into the amount of, of challenges, societal challenges or contribution we can make. In all fairness, this is happening in the strategy process. We spent a lot of time between the execs aligning of what are going to be the big bets, what is the maximum influence that we can have, and where is the conjunction with what we are doing really well, what is going to create revenue for us, and what is going to be great for society. So the mapping happens before. It's not that at the last minute you're going to ask me for a CRM rollout and I'll tell you, no, I have to, to save the lions in Africa. <laughs> it's, it's, we're really having this, this strong overlay during our strategy process. Okay, well, Angela, I want to bring you in. Um, you said to me um, that projects, you need a structure for effective prioritization. And I'm curious how that relates to what uh, Eglatine's saying here. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it, uh, my experience was in a sales and marketing organization and everything is important. So there's many versions of the truth when someone's trying to sell something or someone's got this brilliant idea and they want to do something with it. So there was zero accountability and structure around prioritization of anything. So it was one of the least sexiest things ever. I actually had to step in and go, we need governance. They went, what? I said, governance to run fast, not governance to slow you down. So it was kind of progress without paralysis. 
And in the end, what happened, there was a number of champions in the organisation, but we did formal training as well as light touch training. And we actually set up mechanisms through the organisation from the ground all the way through to the board so that we could capture all these wonderful ideas that were happening, but we could also determine the resource burden over the top of it and to Eglantine's point where it was actually on point to the bigger picture. So it wasn't that there was, you know, 10 projects being run kind of at ground level and we had no idea about. There was no project in that organisation that was being run that we didn't have oversight over. And it literally scaled up. So we might have had 250 of them as we crowdsourced kind of within the organisation. And then we fed that through the funnel to the top. And I think even at board level, we still had to review about 50. Mm. And even then, it was how do you then prioritise these 50 great ideas against the direction of the organisation? So every organisation will have a different subset of how you would score it. We came up with our own score. And then over the top of that, we then did the resource burden. Now, that was an incredibly important part of the whole process because it showed us where we had gaps in skills. Because mm. if one person is 300% expended, what skill set do they have on these projects that we need to scale up somewhere else in the organisation? So it, it actually provided an insight that I wasn't even looking for at the time. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't burning my people out. But we actually used the data to reskill in certain sections of the organisation. So it was a win-win. But you also said when we were talking beforehand, don't pursue a single point of view about prioritisation. So take a broader perspective, mm. because if you take that single point of view, you end up with those conflicts. And I'm curious about that, because in some way, people want this sort of chart or matrix that I'm going to explore with um, Fiona to look at. But how do you, how do you make it broader and, and tell people that it's not just one answer to this? I think that's when you bring the voices to the table and that was important and I know we had a discussion kind of leading up to this around risk committees and how important they are in the whole process of determining what you would go after. I mean when you're based in healthcare, aged care, when patients at the end of the, the line like there's a fairly big call out around risk right at the very top that you need to um, be mindful of. So. For us, there was kind of this anchor about what we knew was not like no compromise, zero harm. And then back from there, what do you do? So for us, it was about the 10 different business lines giving their point of view. And it wasn't about one priority across the entire organisation. The vision was there, the big picture was there. That was kind of the shared strategic intent. But then it was, okay, so what's important to this part of the business? And so that's where you end up with quite legitimately so, if you have 10 lines of business, 10 major themes that you'll run to in that 12 months, and then everyone can get behind it because it's meaningful for them. So they're, they're literally behind the purpose of the area that they work in, but it's driving to the greater vision. So it actually, it worked for us okay. in that instance, but it was a hard slog. That was five years worth of effort. Like it wasn't overnight. Well, I'm gonna bring in Fiona now, because Fiona, you said when you went to STR, the first thing you did was to develop this prioritization matrix. I'd like you to tell us a bit more about that matrix, how you got input from people about what, what those priorities were. And I'm also interested also, uh, Fiona, because you told me, don't think of this as a static document. This is something that's got to be constantly evolving and engaging with people. Could you share your thinking there? So started in the days of STA Health where uh, we were going, we'd gone through significant change. There was a whole new executive team. Um, it was a new industry for me, so I was coming into something that I'd never worked in before. And we didn't have a clearly articulated strategy and I really had to spend time trying to understand what all the opportunities were and then what we were going to focus on as a business. And that's why we came up with the concept of a prioritisation matrix and actually discussing with the executive team, so my peers and the then CEO at the time, um, working through what are our business priorities and how are we going to weight things relative to each other. So we're really making sure that we as an organisation are investing in areas where we're going to get the biggest value for us as an organisation and for our customers, which are essentially the residents in our homes. Um, so I spent, I spent a lot of time, it was a lot of discussions essentially, um, just working through really trying to get those priorities and weight and how they would be weighted and what our focus was as a business. But then, as you mentioned before, it is not a static process and our business has continued to evolve. And each new project goes through that weighting process, but the, the weightings have changed over time and 
now we're at sort of our next phase where we're starting to stand up our, our next strategy under private equity ownership. Uh, it's changed again, and we're looking at what our program might look like under a different way of prioritising. So, yeah, it's something that's continually evolving and needs to evolve as your business does. Okay, let's talk about engagement with stakeholders. And I've got to bring you in, Angela. Why is it advantageous to make people feel uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a phenomenological at that point in time, like it's a lived experience. So yeah. if you're feeling uncomfortable with something, then you're agitated enough to actually understand what it might be like for it to feel better. Although I must admit, I didn't think I'd be branded Samsung or HP on my shoulder when I might have worn that device as it was coming my way, because it was visceral reactions to some changes that you may want to make. And it never got like quite that physical, I say that tongue in cheek, but the, the body language of this poor person that I was putting through this level of change, that to me was you know, just untethered, that's all it was, untethering, fully digital, like just a beautiful suite of, you know, you can do anything anywhere, anytime. This was back in 2018. And this poor person came and stood in front of me with their device, literally shaking at me. I think I could feel the breath on my face going, you did this to me. And I went, what exactly did I do? You made me unable to do my job. And I went, in what way? And anyway, we got to the point where this person just went, ah, so I said, what's your issue? And he said, I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> and I went, okay. <laughs> well, I didn't see that one coming. But I'd made, made him uncomfortable in that moment and then given a safe space where he could actually vent at me in that uncomfortable moment. So I was willing to agitate but then be on the receiving end of what that would actually look like. And what I learnt through that, so this was trial and error, error from my perspective making people uncomfortable, was that in that moment... I got the biggest advocate for digital change and transformation in our organisation because that person went on to lead digital education. <laughs> and so when you've got the person standing there going, I don't know how to turn this on, and then they're actually teaching the organisation about how to be more digital, how to do transformation, you've kind of taken them on that journey. It was one of the best wins of my life. But I think that uncomfortable bit until most people experience something, they don't get it. We had the best test case in the last few years of, you know, untethered remote working, yet I was doing that for 10 years leading up to that moment, but no one could understand the difference and the balance and the change in the way that you would operate if you were able to work that way. So when they got to experience it, it was a whole different game. So that's the uncomfortable bit. But there is also something you were talking about because people can give you the feedback, oh, what's the risk appetite of the yeah. business? And you were telling me, you've got to push that risk appetite. Don't treat that as a uh, cop-out from people. Push that risk mm. boundary. Could you give me a thinking on that? Yeah, so in some cases, you know, when, when you look at the risk, is it, is it a real risk? So is it a legislative risk or is it a preference? And so you start to work through where they're actually coming from with that risk conversation. This is where that risk committee conversation actually came in because in that risk committee, I would challenge and prod at things to make people uncomfortable knowing what the North Star was, which zero harm, safety, patient care. So you know exactly what that hold true is. But inside of that, when you're actually wanting to take risks with technology and with people's skill sets, with how the organisation is shaped, then you've got quite a lot of opportunity in there. And it's not this old adage of that's the way we used to do it. It's actually for them they feel it as a risk. And that's a very different set of behavioural responses to we did it the old way. And so once you sit down and you unpack the risk, then you're able to actually move forward. And, and in challenging it, you have to challenge it both respectfully but very openly and candidly to put it on the table. And this is where I found that risk committee environment actually worked so well. I knew what I wanted to do, but I you know, getting someone from quality, getting someone from reg, getting someone from patient care to sit in the room and say, actually, Ange, that's not going to work. Well, then tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why. And then that, that committee then forms the opinion. You go, okay, well, we can actually do this. There was two occasions where I went, all right, we won't do this. All right. Okay. So that was fine. I want to bring in Fiona. But Fiona, you were talking to me. Yeah. You said you work in a very conservative organisation, so people who are not instinctively digital natives. Yep. And you were talking about the, the importance of empathy, asking questions, engaging the reaction that you get to the question, testing the waters. Can you yep. share your insights there? 
Yeah, sure. I'm certainly not an agitator. <laughs> it's not the <laughs> approach I follow. Um, I spend a lot of time really trying to understand our business and understand where our challenges and, and our goals are and then looking at what might be potential, active, uh, potential technologies we can put on the table that might solve these particular problems. Um, so I do a lot of testing concepts with the exec team. So I might take you know, a short presentation to an exec meeting and see if there's any interest in gauge. Um, you know, if people ask a lot of questions, it generally means they're interested. If you don't hear a lot, it generally means it's probably dead in the water or you've got to think about it and come back in a different way if you think it's really important and you really need to drive that through the organisation. Um, we also spend a lot of time now more piloting technologies um, and really sort of playing in small scales because for us, we're, we're now at 75 aged care homes, so to roll out technology across 75 locations can be quite expensive. And so if we can pilot in small places, really show the value of technology, then you get more people on board and then you get the investment to roll it out more broadly. Mm -hmm. And you also use the term to me, a need, a need to be persistent, doggedly persistent, but not annoying. How do, how do you finesse that? I did that? say that, yes. Um, <laughs> it's a hard balance. It really is a hard balance. Um, but I think if you think that sometimes it's hard for people to see the possibilities in a technology that you see because you're looking at it from a different perspective. And so I think it's really about time, uh, taking the time to really understand others' perspectives and where they're coming from, what their barriers are, and then helping them work through overcoming those barriers, really in the way that you were talking about before. Yeah. Okay. You said to me about having moonshots and engaging with people, and I'm interested in that because the, the common wisdom in IT is be gentle, test the waters, grow from that sort of stuff. You sort of saying being bold. You were talking about uh, reinventing, redoing your whole application suite for a tenth of the original cost of doing it. It seems a really uh, uh, bold, courageous thing to do. Tell me why you think that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and yeah, you're saying we, we tend to be a respectful and risk adverse, but not if you're on Jenna from what I gather. So <laughs> you know, I, I, I love this idea. I love the combination of what I've just heard, this, this idea that you want to be very challenging in a respectful way. Uh, and I think that's really very important when, when you work with your, with your stakeholders and peers on, on uh, you know, just getting to paint this vision. Um, the, the moonshot, I'm using them mostly actually to engage my team. And, and what I find is, so you're talking about the organization, uh, challenges of organizations that are not digital native, but I'm in a digital native organization. And both my peers, my board, and definitely my team are very tech savvy. Uh, and yet, you come into a routine, you, we have our challenges, we have our risk, it's critical infrastructure in Australia, high cyber risk, high resilience risk, high reg risk. Um, and all of a sudden it becomes the way you operate. And the way you've structured the organization becomes the way you operate. And, and what I've found is, unless you have a circuit breaker, you just stay in that path. And maybe the path is good enough. Actually, we are on a good market. We, we felt like we had a bit of a challenging year last year, but how challenging was it really, you know, if you compare to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we're in this market, we, we are, we, we are I'm not saying we are cruising, but we don't have this burning platform that some of us felt during COVID. It's very rare here in Australia, it's very rare. So how do you create that new perspective, that burning ambition the other way around? And the way I'm tackling is with moonshots. And the moonshots are really coming di directly from, from, from the strategy and our ambition and looking at what if, you know? So today it takes us five years to go to a new market. What if it could take us, what if it was taking us one year to go to a new market? What if it was taking us one year to go to five markets? And then we work backwards as what needs to happen? What needs to be true for that to happen? And it's extremely uncomfortable with the team because we end up committing to things that we have tested sufficiently to th think we are, I know how to go to 50 to, let's say, max 70%, but honestly, the 30% remaining, I have no idea how I'm going to make it work. What that does is it unlocks a creativity, which is unbelievable, and it unlocks um, what I was describing earlier, this idea that you're on rails and you're thinking of my team is organized like this. All of a sudden, you have to, do I have the right partner? Am I thinking about technology properly? What are the other uh, so partnerships that I can build? What are the other ways I can be looking at these things? But you cannot 
think incremental when you have a moonshot. You really have to flip it on its head. I find it very powerful. Okay, now we're talking the final bit is uh, how do we know we're on a progressive technology strategy? And Fiona, I'll bring in you because following up the point that Eglaton said, which is about the team and getting the team enthused and excited, yes. that was an element that I got from you about that. You really want to broaden their thinking and their perspectives. Can you give us some insights about how you do that? Yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that. So it's not just about developing tech skills, it's really about that strong understanding of the business. Um, where, you know, what our business is aiming for, where are our business problems. We, um, we have regular off-sites with the team where we get um, speakers in from across the business to talk about their different areas. Um, we've had some interesting insights through that conversation, things that, you know, we, we think we know what we know, but sometimes someone will come in and put something really different on the table that you probably haven't thought about from that perspective. Um, so I think really that getting good understanding of your business and insights from your business across the team, so it's not just me bringing ideas to the table, it's the whole team bringing ideas to the table. Um, and then I think the other perspective that we're thinking about it from is also creating that space for them to actually spend time out of their day-to-day -day job doing something about it. You know, we all talk about innovation, we've probably got lots of different ways of thinking about innovation. Um, where we run particularly lean and, and there's a lot on. My team will tell you every day there's a lot on. But we make sure we set time specifically aside so we're focusing on something that's not our day to day and we can spend time thinking about how to do things differently for our business. Mm. And uh, in this term of progressive, because another side of the angle of this is the hype in the industry and people can get, the executives can get ideas that maybe aren't feasible or practical. And, and refining those ideas was something that you were talking to me about. Can you share how, how you do that? Yeah, so ultimately it's got to solve a problem or help an organisation grow in a different way. So if, if the shiny object's not doing any of that, you've got to ask the question, why are we actually doing it? And sometimes it's the roles that we play to actually challenge the tech that we're supposed to be implementing at that point in time. So. That was probably one of the most profound things because I, I remember sitting in a room not long after I was CIO and um, the MD said, oh, if you want to see the most shiniest object, look at the tech leader. And I went, actually, this is five years old. I don't need the shiny one just yet because I don't think the next shiny one is the one I want. I want to move the entire organisation to this one for these particular reasons. So I think at that point he got the shock of his life that I wasn't going out chasing all the shiny objects. I was no bower bird. I was actually quite happy with what I had. But in saying that, to Fiona's point, the um, how you embed that kind of process of the problem solving, the 50 for, for me, it was 50, 30, 20. So 50% in your role, 30% developing and looking forward to where, or 30% looking forward to where that role should be and then 20% developing towards it. So you create this hyperloop that continues to evolve and move the organisation forward. And when the entire organisation is in that space, they are problem solving. They're not looking at the shiny object and that's a critical bit. And then you move your team from an empowered team to an emancipated team. You don't actually need to be there anymore. And that's the beauty of the whole loop moving forward. All right. I'm going to give you the final word because you said, you said to me, you said, <laughs> if you uh, don't prosecute an argument for change, if you don't be the visionary about where that business could be, you're giving away your power. And you said that quite forcefully about that. Is that from a practical experience you've learned in your career that you've got, you've got to actually be... The, the prosecutor for change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, absolutely. That, that's that's a huge cliche for all of us here. We we know that now. I mean, you're looking at uh, the challenges, you know, of uh, productivity in Australia, and, and look at uh, what are the solutions are going to be. They sit in, in this room. They don't sit anywhere else. We need to make sure that our peers are supported, and that they and they, and we are educating them. But ultimately, it's going to come from us. What I find is we, we have, and, and, and I was pretty particularly forceful because we are both uh, in technology and we are women. And, and it's a bit of a double challenge when you're sitting at that table and you have that vision and you can see what are the big shifts that you could get the organization through. Um, but you don't necessarily feel that you have that voice at the table, both because technology doesn't always have the voice at the table. And I think because as a woman, we have an additional challenge. Uh, when I look at, at that today, I think the, the, the piece that I have found particularly uh, empowering and helping me overcome my personal challenge in, in being that voice is going back to my first point, the social responsibility. 
if we don't drive that change ourselves in this room, it's, it's the whole country challenges that we continue to create. If we stay on our lane, if we continue to let the business pushing us around with other priorities, it's the whole co country that we are keeping backwards. So I think if we sign for a CIO, CTO, or any tech leader role nowadays, we have a huge responsibility in bringing our organization and our society forward. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please thank the panelists?